Hello everyone and welcome back to Code with the Italians. Today we are not coding, uh, we still have Italians. And also we have uh, someone you might have seen before, uh, <laughs> our first book club guest today is uh, Chet Haas. Hey Chet. Hey, book club. That makes it sound like we should have like, I don't know, discussions about literature but themes and stuff. Like, what did you what did you think of the exposition of the character in chapter seven? I, I thought that the epilogue was. <laughs> I I found the. Yeah. And then I I was I was hoping for a <laughs> wedding at the end, you know that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, but they 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 looked so in love, and I was like, okay, I mean, what uh, we should align on the book next time, just to have a rough idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I need to write down some of these ideas because I am looking for ideas for a sequel. And actually, the idea of a wedding <laughs> in the sequel is really good because then the third book could All be right. about the divorce. Oh. So, yeah, I see yeah. A, a whole oh, long so it's story like, arc. Like, uh, yeah, like a book a trilogy. trilogy kind of uh, that's good for, for sales, I guess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it it worked for uh, it worked for Game of Thrones. With your trilogy of how yeah. many in it? Uh, you know, or yeah, Wheel of Time. My my favorite trilogy that just kept going and going and going until the author finally died before he actually resolved the story. That was, that was why nobody should ever get into a series until it's done. Yeah. Well, also, also Game of Thrones, the, the wedding part uh, worked well. I mean, uh, there, are, <laughs> there are pleasant bits. Uh, that's, uh, that's also a fascinating thing. So, Chad, thank you for being with us. This is a, a honor for me. Uh, we never met in person because Google I.O. it, it was not Love possible that. and I'm not a London, droid gone London <laughs> aficionado, unfortunately. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for me. Uh, uh, thank you. Oh, yeah, thanks for having me. Nice to On my uh, side, nice to I just wanted to well. say thank you for waking up at stupid o'clock on a Sunday. Uh, really appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wake up, Juice. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. As long as coffee, it's all good. So, uh, for those who don't um, know Chet, first of all, why are you here? And uh, second of all, <laughs> uh, Chet, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, why am I here? Because you talk about Android, and I've been doing Android since 2010 when I joined the team. Uh, and I've done, done mostly engineering. I took a couple of year break doing developer relations stuff. And then along the way, you can see a, a book that Yvonne is holding out. Um, there, I realized after working hard for a couple of years that uh, um, there was kind of an interesting story about how Android began and the people that brought it to life and the fact that it actually managed to um, succeed to some extent uh, in the the weird smartphone platform uh, idea that that started at that time, and I I just thought all of those combination of ideas were a story worth telling, and somebody should do that. And then uh, I waited for several years, and nobody did that. Um, and then I realized maybe that was up to me. Uh, so is, that, I is it a good a idea? Time. You know, you are always struggling. You're like like I mean, nobody ever thought about this. Is it really a good idea, or people are just lazy? <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized, no, 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 this is the Android. People are busy. Like all the people on the yeah. team, like they're happy that the story is out there. Like I got really good support from people like Diane Hackborn and Brian Swetlin and Ficus Kirkpatrick. Like they're all happy that someone did this, but they had no intention of taking their own time to do it because they have far more important things to work on. Um, I think it, it took someone that like, yeah, I love writing code and I love thinking about technology, but I also really enjoy articulating how stuff works. And so it, I think it took someone to say, not just, you know, oh, this is an interesting story, but actually, you know, sacrificing a bunch of weekends and evenings um, to say, you know, well, it's worth taking some of my time to actually describe what happened here, because otherwise we're going to forget, like I forget stuff that happened last week. And I, I would hate to go, you know, years and years down the line and have people like Diane and Brian and Ficus forget what they worked on or not care about it anymore because, you know, the world has moved on. So it's, I thought it was important to sort of capture this little snippet of tech history um, to better understand how things happen. Not, and not just not just Android um, either. I think it's important to realize this is just one of an infinite number of tech projects 
that I think all of us in the industry sort of understand how this stuff happens, but taking a step back and saying, yeah, but how did it happen? And why did it happen? And what are the dynamics of um, of the industry or of what we work on uh, that are interesting for people on the outside to understand? I personally love the book. Like I, I found it extremely interesting because you might from the outside or maybe speaking to people every now and then get some bits and pieces of the story, maybe try to put them together, but you don't really have the, the full picture. And I, I found this book extremely interesting because it gave me an opportunity to peer into the early days of Android, the story of the people, especially uh, that, that made it happen. Uh, and I learned about, the, uh, about a, a lot of things, even about people that I kind of know, like people that I've met before, that I've talked with, and I found out new things about them as well, which was extremely interesting. Um, and um, I, I really wish that this kind of book was done about more things, because to me, it was incredibly interesting. I'm not saying you should do it, Chet, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Uh, yeah. You already I, took I mean, one for the team, right? But maybe maybe this is the first. Well, we were talking about sequels, so you know who knows. I mean, there are there are other books in the genre, um, but I I do think that there's space for more. I find it fascinating. One of the things that I that I learned about that I wanted to talk about was the connection of all of those people to each other and to things that they'd worked at and technologies that they'd worked on before they got to Android. Because one of the dynamics in our industry is that it's not like things are just created out of the ether. Things build upon other things and upon ideas um, and technologies that have come before. And connecting all of those, I find is really fascinating. Things like, you know, people like Apple that were working on things there, people that worked on, God help them, a smartphone platform at General Magic in the early 90s. If you can imagine creating a smartphone in the days before there was even a data network, like what were they thinking? They were thinking great things, but it was about 10 years too early, right? So there was a really good reason why General Magic didn't succeed. But the fact that people had been thinking about this stuff that early on meant that, you know, those ideas could keep percolating and those could be people could keep moving around to other companies and then sort of come together when the timing was right to to make it all happen. So yeah, I, I see this as like, this is an interesting story for Android, but I think there are other fascinating stories about other companies and technologies that would also be worth knowing more about too. I, I wanted to talk about too, like one of the, one of the, there, there were some premises that I wanted to tackle in the book, but there were also, um, you could call them agenda items, uh, where I wanted to, I wanted people to understand that this project, as all projects, are not just the creation of you know somebody smart at the top who happened to be an executive driving a project and getting acquired and stuff. And I think that's the impression that most people have outside of projects because that is what the media people know about, right? So the company will talk about a particular executive or journalists will interview a particular person and that person becomes sort of the spokesman for the spokesperson for that thing um, but that's not accurate right that that thing came about because a large usually a very large team of people that that work together to ship that thing there are some i i think it's it's propagated by some executives being um wanting to be that person certainly steve jobs mm. comes to mind right like that he very clearly saw himself as, you know, the creator or the the person behind a lot of that technology. And to be fair, I think that he was a driving force behind a lot of it. But to say that he invented all of that stuff, like that's taken it a bit too far. But because of the way that that PR engine works for Apple, where a brand, they don't really want to talk about the other people inside the company for very good reasons. But then you get the impression that that person was the only person that invented or worked on any of this technology. And clearly that's not true. Yeah. Right. And so I wanted to go beyond the executives, go beyond the names and the, the founders that people had heard of before and actually talk about the rest of that was an important part of building this thing. Um, I feel like it, we've been talking a good 10 minutes, but we haven't really said much about what the book is. <laughs> so probably worth <laughs> mentioning. 
this is what the book looks like. Sure. <laughs> you can uh, get it on sure. Amazon. You can get it uh, digital from a variety of sources. Maybe, Chet, you have a better list than I do. Yep. Uh, sure. Yeah. So the paperbacks are only available on Amazon for now. Uh, the ebook is available on Amazon, Google Play Books, Apple Books, and Kobo. Um, I'd never even heard of Kobo before. Uh, the intention was to try to get it available in as many places as possible. I uh, The paperback is not because Amazon is more limited than I expected. Um, not just you know my ability to market the paperbacks on on that you know print on demand store, but just their ability to sell it in various countries. So there is there is a plan afoot where um, I'm going to be working with a publisher. I just signed some paperwork this week um, that should be able to get wider distribution. It's going to be it should be the same book. I think the 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 format should be a little bit nicer than what I'm able to do with print on demand services. Um, but there should be an edition available sometime in the future that's going to be wider and, you know, hopefully even uh, something that you could get in bookstores if those things still exist by the time it comes out. Um, so that's the, that's the general plan for it. I, I see questions. Should yeah, I, I mean, you, questions you can either pick up the, the questions that we have uh, from Twitter that we wrote down. You can pick up questions from the chat as you wish. Before we start with the questions, I think even okay. as a couple of things to say yeah. very quickly, and then we can get going with all the questions. Yes, great. Um, yes, so uh, today the usual uh, the usual giveaway um, things uh, that we have lately. So we are gonna raffle the IntelliJ Idea um, license from YouTube. Uh, if you look up our playlist, there is uh, our episode with Yossi. Uh, if if you comment with the word YOLO, uh, you will enter the, the giveaway. <clears throat> you can subscribe uh, to the channel and we are going to just pick your name uh, later um, later during the show. Um, we also have a couple of uh, tickets for DroidCon Berlin and DroidCon London that we are going to uh, give away during the show. Uh, these are going to be done uh, live, so I'm going to just drop a, a word um, a specific word in the chat, you type the word and the bot is going to just pick one of the winners. So no, no, no big news from this side and that the usual, I don't want to take too much time. Um, just to, to the people that are uh, watching, uh, probably you will see ads. Uh, that's an unfortunate situation for us because uh, that's how Twitch works. To avoid the pre-roll, we need to run ads during the show. To avoid seeing the ads, uh, you can subscribe. You can become uh, either you can do it for free if you have an Amazon Prime subscription. Uh, you can connect your Amazon Prime to your Twitch account because Uncle Bezos bought everything a few years ago. Plus, he's also giving you uh, one free subscription every month. So uh, he's going to space, but he's also giving you free subscription to Twitch channels. So you can. You can subscribe for free to our channel and you don't you support us so we can buy more stickers stickers and we can send you more stickers and uh, you don't see ads. Thank Done. you, Ivan. I, I think you're you're improving was, your speaking. speech now. <laughs> like day after day, you're getting better and better and more succinct. <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have <laughs> Jesus, that was quick. So thank you. So chat, <laughs> do you want to answer Mark's question first? Uh, sure. So Mark Allison uh, in the chat asked about Terry Pratchett, which is um, absolutely very true. So uh, question, have you read much Terry Pratchett? He's much admired for his mastery of the footnote. I was wondering if he was a source of inspiration to um, absolutely. I don't know uh, inspiration as much as I really enjoy that format. And I um, Romain and I had used that to some extent in the Filthy Rich Clients tech book that we wrote many, many, many years ago. Um, so there were a bunch of footnotes in there and I found it very helpful in this book. I mean, maybe it's just my style, but like I, I want the book itself to have a very conversational flow and to be um, somewhat informal because that's me. Like I don't want it to make it a, an academic book. Um, however, there is a bunch, you know, there is a narrative flow that it needs to follow. And some of the stuff is fairly, you know, technical or at least um, involved. And I. I always have the feeling that, you know, 
uh, let's let's break this up. I do this in meetings as well. Like, let's break up this serious conversation with, you know, a joke, an aside, a, a little anecdote, uh, whatever, just to sort of keep the levity there, no matter what's going on. And footnotes to me are useful for that, for just going, oh, did you know this thing here? And, and then it's kind of an optional, like everybody knows when they pop out of the text and they read the footnote, like they're taking a little break there. Some of it is citations, you know, that needs to be there for whatever reason or, you know, describe what CL means or something. Um, but most of it is is my bit of fun, more the way that, as Mark says, Terry Pratchett does it, where it is just just constant, constant footnotes. I think there are nearly 500 in the book. Um, somebody somebody sent me an image of the book. They'd Photoshop the cover and rewrote the title as footnotes, the team that built the Android <laughs> operating system. Um, which I think is is probably appropriate. I saw somebody on Goodreads actually complaining about having too many footnotes, but it's the style I chose. I will say that it complicates the audiobook uh, a bit because I think when you're reading a book, there's a visual cue where I am choosing to yeah. leave the narrative and go down to the bottom of the page to read something. But in an audio stream that is like one thread, how do you do that? And so I'm, I, I'm experimenting with something that I, I think works where I use a filter effect to put it in kind of a different voice, and I say footnote. So I, I, you automatically know when you hear this thing that you're about to hear an aside here. And I'm also dropping a bunch of the duller ones that nobody wants to hear anyway, uh, and just keep have, it a uh, little music, bit more engaging. Uh, in the background while you read footnotes mm. in the audiobook. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not. I do not because that would just complicate the whole project even more. It's hard enough to finish this thing. Man, the audiobook. Someone had asked about this on Twitter, like, are there plans for an audiobook? Absolutely. In fact, I've already recorded myself reading the entire book, which I thought took a long time. And then I started processing the audio. And now I understand what a long time actually means because it's taken me like three to four times the amount of time to process each chapter just in terms of going through. So as I'm speaking this, you can hear me sucking in air to say the next sentence. And like that is normal in conversation. It is annoying in a book. And I notice like the real good readers that I listen to in audiobooks don't breathe. Right. And either <laughs> they, they never really breathe. Good. Um, <laughs> you know, I think there are ways to do that without making like an audible breath sound. I don't know how to do that. Uh, but the other approach is you go in afterwards and you manually remove every single one of those things and it is a complete hassle. So that's what, fun. What do you mean manually? Are you not using machine learning for that? <laughs> uh, you you would think I would be too. Um, that is one of those technologies I have not conquered and I would love to not add yes. that to the list. Tell me about it. Audio book I, I totally <laughs> feel your pain because I have... I mean, uh, Worked uh, like I've done a few episodes uh, of a podcast with a friend, and editing out the breathing and the oh, yeah. uh, that takes like twice yeah. as much as recording, maybe more. Oh yeah, it, yeah, easily. And w and we don't do that for the ADB podcast. Like w that is just a conversation. Like if you don't want to listen yeah. to a rough conversation, then you're in the wrong podcast. Like I I think everybody knows. And podcast is a little bit different too. Like it is an informal um, uh, format, and you know unless you're one of those like highly mm -hmm. polished things where it's really an audio book in podcast form, that's that's a little different. Maybe that's worth spending the time on. But ADB, man, we have a conversation. We, you know, cut it, we tack on the, the header and the footer and we ship it. And we are not going to the trouble to edit out the the ums and the uhs and the 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 breaths. We might we might edit yeah, well, out an F bomb if we happen to miss say one, but that hasn't happened so. Yeah. What was that? There, there was the same the same thing that we we thought the stream. So with the after the live, we the recording ends up on YouTube tomorrow after 24 hours, but we don't we don't edit anything so the idea was like okay this is it so so this is like a so not this episode because this is a, like a special episode but the usual uh live coding sessions that we do that that's the same thing that it will happen at work right so we you you, you have to take it or leave it <laughs> so the, we we it's a it's a low effort and even if we don't edit it's a lot of effort, so I can understand. I, I don't. I don't want to think about how much time it's gonna take you to to edit those bits. It's impressive.
Yep. No, I, and I, I think that's the right thing to do too. Not only is it more effort and, you know, this is not your job, right? So it's, it's, if it becomes too much effort, then you're not going to do this, which is the way that we feel about A to B as well. It's not our job. It's something that we do because it does not take much effort and time from us. On the other hand, I also think that it is, um, it's a more honest format, right? Like this is not a highly polished thing. This is a really, you know, a spontaneous conversation that we are having with these people. And so I think having the ums and the uhs and the pauses and the breaths and like, it's just a conversation. I think that that helps reinforce that notion and make it more honest. Do you think, Chet, that nice. uh, working on ADB for all this time uh, has helped you prepare for uh, the book? Because it's, I don't know if it's more conversations you've had or interviews, uh, but it seems like there's a, there's a, some similarities between the, the kind of interaction you have with people. Uh, yeah, I think, I think it all contributes. Like I have been having conversations with people through the podcast, um, for years to say, what do you work on? Oh, how does that work? And then you ask these follow-up questions and certainly, you know, the interviews, like I would, I would approach all interviews with the same template five questions, but really they were just catalysts to spark a longer conversation. So you know, I got I got the answers to those questions in, you know, three minutes, but that really wasn't the point. It was more, hey, what did you work on before Android? Oh, how did that work? Oh, what was B trying to accomplish with that? And so you sort of go down these threads. And I think that is an element that you, you know, you learn or at least practice in something like a podcast where the point is not to get an answer to your question. The point is to have an interesting conversation and a back and forth about a larger and growing surface area of technology or of life. Um, I, I actually will take another question from uh, Twitter, which is um, somewhat yeah. silly, but how many donuts or in general release themed sweets have you consumed <laughs> during the, the creation of the book? Because I, I understood that took some time. So. <laughs> It did. So we could probably calculate it um, because the book took almost four years. So it published in mid-August. The first interview for the book was August 30th with Diane Hackborn um, in 2017. So let's count that as four years. Um, every single week I have donuts on Friday and I usually end up having two, let's say, unless it's more. And so that's uh, 52 times, 52 weeks times four would be 208 uh, times two uh, would be 416. So yeah, over 400. I do donuts. admire um, your restraint though, concerned. that it's only once a week. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would be more if they were there. Like if there's a donut in front of me, I will eat it. Um, but I, I have a, a tradition. So it started at the office, like for many years. Um, well, actually, at Sun, they used to have like donuts on Wednesday, donuts and bagels on Wednesday, until the company started doing this as tech companies do, um, and then they they cut out that little thing. Uh, but then we uh, we would have you know our own private donut club where we we would bring it in. Or I started that tradition in uh, the toolkit team uh, at Google where. I would bring in donuts on Friday and then other people would bring them in. And then we just, you know, we have a, we have a calendar event that we share called the donut mutex. So you <laughs> grab the mutex so that nobody else mistakenly brings in more donuts, which doesn't sound like a problem, except, you know, I'd rather have those donuts next week instead of too many this week. Um, so we just have a group of people that informally would bring in donuts every week. And it's just kind of a nice sort of work team, people, sugar and fat thing that we have going. Uh, and then we went into pandemic and that weekly thing at work went away. So then I enforced it on my family and said, on Friday morning, you're having donuts, whether you want them or not. And occasionally the other kids would be like, no, nah, I don't really feel like I'm like, that's not a choice. That's it's, it's Best. which donut do you want? It's not a choice of whether you want them yeah. or not. Um, so that's as sort long of as you live in my house. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> As long as you live in my house, this yes. is my house, my rules. You get <laughs> exactly, <the door. laughs> exactly. I don't come down on the sort of harsh parent thing occasionally, but you know what? Donuts are important. <laughs> the, I'm gonna stand my ground here. Have you ever had a deadlock with donuts uh, mutexes? 
Uh, yes, uh, twice. Um, so the reason the mutex exists is because uh, both Jeff Sharkey and I brought in donuts on the same day, and we realized that we need a mutex because this was just too uh, too chaotic. You didn't know what was happening until you arrived at the office, and there were too many. And so I created the donut mutex, and then about a year later, I grabbed the mutex uh, that morning, and I brought donuts in. Jeff Sharkey walked in with donuts because he had forgotten to check the <laughs> mutex. So the, the mutex actually failed in its fundamental job with the people that caused it. It completely failed. Um, but you otherwise, that's useful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's true in yeah. software in general, I think. Ivan, do you want to ask some questions, maybe? Yes, I am gonna just uh, go and pick another question because we we had a, um, a brief uh, introduction about the the audiobook and there is a there is a, a, a second part of the question that we had from Twitter people um, if there are audio. So the audiobook will contain snippets from interview recordings or uh, impressions yeah. of people. So let's say let, I, I don't want to. So let's say the impressions are off the table. I hope yes. Uh, but the, the the snippets of the the interview it will be it will be nice. Would it be possible? Do you think? Yeah, I. Uh... I'm very mixed on this. So I listened to a book by Malcolm Gladwell, who he's a writer I really enjoy, writes about all kinds of things. Actually, I think all engineers would enjoy uh, Malcolm Gladwell because he he starts out with an assumption like, here's how you think things work in this particular area. And now I'm going to go look at the data and I'm going to analyze it. And I'm going to convince you that it's completely turned around, right? Um, so he's really good at, at sort of analyzing what's really going on between behind interesting things. And his latest book is called The Bomber Mafia. And it came out first as an audio book. And it was exactly that. Instead of him reading his book, he's a good reader, uh, but he would integrate some of the source audio that went into the book, whether it was recordings from the 40s or 50s, or whether it was interviews that he'd done with people. And the audio was, was crap. Like I couldn't listen to an entire book with those because some of those recordings were really rough and hard to understand. But as source material, as a little bit of like richness, I think it really added to the book. And so uh, I thought um, that would be an interesting thing to do with this book because I have all these source recordings as well. Um, but there are a couple of things that are probably gonna make it so that I can't do that. One is I reached out to a couple of the people that are really important in the book and they were not interested in having their voice out there, right? So I think, I, uh, you know, I've done talks for years. I've gotten used to my voice. Like I'm I, you, sure it sounds dumb to me, but that's not really a factor anymore. I think everybody's voice sounds dumb to them. But if you yeah. don't do that for a living, if you're not constantly, you know, recording yourself and having to listen to it, you probably don't go over that. And you feel like I don't really want that out there for other people to hear. And so I think a lot of people that I interviewed that are really key sources would not be happy with that. And so I wouldn't do it. I, I wouldn't do it without their permission. So that's yeah. one element. Another element is I am talking to an audiobook uh, recording company about having them do this for me because um, I'll get back to that in a minute, but it turns out it's a lot of work to actually put a book out there that, that people want to read. Um, so they're going to take on the work of actually like publishing this thing and getting it out there, which is fantastic. But they only do this with like traditional audiobooks where there is a reader instead of like a performance. Um, now, having said that, what I would like to do, like once I once I finish that project, which is just going to be me not doing impressions, not using the original source audio. Um, once I get that out there, then it's possible that I could um, release some, you know, promo or podcast things that's uh, where I could work with some of the people that are interested in this and do sort of uh maybe some of the some of the parts of the book that lend themselves to that sort of uh, mix of audio i i would like to look into that but i think the book overall uh it's not going to be possible to do that i would love to but it's yep not going to work yeah, i can imagine with that many people Thank involved you. that might be complicated yeah yeah and and it's it's a little hard too because the the conversations, I mean, I think it would be a really interesting project, but like it is a lot of work. Um, but the conversations that I have, like I would I would have these interviews and I'd transcribe them and then I would incorporate them into the book. But then I would need to 
edit out this and that, like that thing they said in the middle didn't really fit the context that I was going for there. Or, you know, maybe I reordered some sentences or maybe we took a long time to get to the point. And, and I think that's interesting, uh, but I think it would be tricky to figure out how to integrate a lot of that stuff yeah. in, in a way that made sense. Um, or I would necessarily need to, you know, limit the amount that I was doing that because otherwise it would be sort of too confusing to have too much of that more wandery stuff because it was just, you know, conversations that were not intended for for um, public hearing yeah. to begin Got with. It. Um, should we run the Droid Berlin giveaway in the meantime? I was thinking while we answer the next question, yes. people can start yes. writing things in the chat. Yeah, so for the people in the chat, so the word that you are going to type is pepperoni. So I'm going to just run run a timer, five minute timer. So go crazy, type pepperoni in the chat to uh, join the giveaway for DroidCon Berlin. You already have a ticket for DroidCon Berlin chat. I knew it. I knew it. You were going to go. I knew it. Uh, so anyway, for everybody else that want to go to DroidCon London, let's no, 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 no. Let's London. do Berlin first. Let's um, not mix it up. First we do Berlin, then we we do London let's, in the over the next. Let's do. <laughs> okay. So if you want to go to DroidCon uh, Berlin, type pepperoni, and for the next five minutes, then we are gonna uh, pick a winner. Um, so about uh, there was uh, one of the questions that I actually uh, like that we have, Sebastian. If I sure. can, if I can pick, pick another question. So uh, there was uh, where is it? Where is it? Uh, no. Did Maybe I you did. did I imagine the question? Oh, no. Yeah, no, no, no problem. No. Uh, no, there, here you go. Uh, so what's the best, the worst part of working on a project like this? So I, I had a bit of experience writing books oh, and okay. I also decided that I'm not doing, actually one of my books, uh, I, uh, it gave me, reading this, it gave me a lot of um, like Proust Magdalene kind of thing because I, at the beginning I started with working on Android as a system. So we were building custom ROMs. So yeah. I have a, a fair amount of knowledge on how Android were very, very low on the, and and I, we eventually with uh, with Stefano that I think is in the, in the chat, uh, we wrote a book about how you can build your own version of Android, you know, starting from uh, OSP, of course. Yeah. Um, so the, the question is that, Writing a book is is it's a it's a beach, okay? That's a funny. <laughs> yeah, I don't I, I don't want to. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah, and so, but there are a lot of good things and good memories and very bad memories. What would you say for this book for you? What was the the best and or the worst um, of writing this specific book? Sure. Um, well, I think th there is the generic thing that's the best and worst about. Um, about every book. Uh, so I, I, this is my sixth book, I think. The the humor books that I did are a little bit different because those were solutions of things that I'd done and then it was more a, a just a project that I did pretty informally. Uh, but the programming books, um, I think that I did many years ago, uh, share this in common, which is the best part is writing. Like the reason I do this is because I want to write. I I enjoy the process of, understanding how something worked, whether it's, you know, highly technical or the social dynamics of this project or whatever, and then articulating it. Like it's part of why I like to go out and do talks and articles and stuff is I, I just like sort of threading um, that needle, connecting the dots between how does something work and how do people understand it. Um, and so I, I enjoy that process of writing. And I also enjoy, as you might expect, like trying to be um, trying to be amusing, trying to be engaging, right? How can I express this, not just to get the point across, but how can I actually make it funny for people or enjoyable to read? Like that to me is a puzzle um, to try to express things through, you know, it's the asides and the footnotes, it's the the analogies, whatever it is, 
um, that makes it more of an engaging read as opposed to just this um, more academic read, right? So that's joyous to me. Editing is not, um, and editing takes far, far, far longer. Um, so the process of, you know, understanding that that 500, 600 pages that you wrote isn't comprehensible to anybody else. And now you need to go through and you need to rewrite and you need to rewrite and you need to catch your errors and you need to read it all again and you need to reorder things. And it just goes on and on and on and on. And I think the, the, that, that is really tedious about all of these things is, and it's, if you want to write a book, do it because you want to write um, and understand that that's where the joy is going to come from. And you have to slog through a lot more of the pain. And so you just have to remember why you, why you did it to begin with. And I think that, the darkest part of this one, like it did take so very long. The previous books that I did were, you know, under a year uh, in terms of like compiling the information to describe the technology, writing it down, editing, working with the publisher, getting it out there. Um, this one was four years. And I think the the worst part was not knowing during the middle of that period whether it would ever finish because that that just killed my soul. The fact that the story wouldn't get out there or the fact that I had spent so very much time and energy and effort on this thing um, and feeling like, you know, am I actually going to make it to the finish line with this or is it just going to die on the vine? Um, so fortunately, it did get out there. It was pretty happy uh, in the household in August when I when I got there. But I didn't know, you know, a year ago um, whether it was actually going to, you know, make it across that line. Makes sense. Yeah, editing was brutal, especially because I'm not a native speaker. So, you know, the way I write in English, uh, like my my English, uh, it probably wouldn't suit. Uh, so, yeah, I can I, I really definitely can relate. Uh, but, you know, my mom is happy because she can look for my name on Amazon and books come up. So that's also something good, right? Yep. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it, it is. And it's it. I mean, it sounds it sounds, but it is. I think for anybody that likes to express themselves, that's that's a nice sort of you know, it's not a goal to go for it, but it's a nice thing being able to say, oh, I did this thing, and there it is, right? As opposed to like you describe to people the thing that you work on, and it's all a bit nebulous. No, no, no. This is like it's a milestone. Like here's this thing that I did, and it expresses some amount of me, you know, and the project and the technology and you know that thing that you were writing about. But there's also a lot of us in anything that we write um and and i think it's i think it just feels good to be able to point people at it and say that and it, it's it's kind of like you know finishing a class in college or getting a certificate or a degree or whatever it's like you not only did the work but you have a thing to prove that you did it you you carried that project through to completion it's you know it's shipping the 1.0 it's having the test suite that verifies that everything works it's it's not just oh i had an, an idea for an interesting algorithm it's no no and then i implemented it and i got the whole project working and it's in a product and there you can use it over there and i think a book or any more sort of polished and and finalized thing is is some of that like no no, no i didn't just write down a bunch of junk on you know on a blog somewhere I actually like finely tuned it and worked with people you know, designers and editors and reviewers and rewrote and rewrote and rewrote. Right. And here is the final product that I, I th think expresses the original thing that I was going for. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the bot has chosen a winner. So congrats, uh, Subash. I don't know how to read that. Oh, I didn't Sorry, Chad. It. But uh, yeah, we, can, <laughs> we are going to run the one for London now. So you can apply to DroidCon London if you want. Oh. Uh, it's probably yes. going to be a different word, I was going to say. So if, <laughs> oh. Yeah, so if you, well, I mean, if you want to, uh, if you want to go to London, type um, oregano. And for the next five minutes, <laughs> we are going to pick the, the new ticket for DroidCon London. I, um, I'd like to point out that if you are going to London, they say oregano. <laughs> Oregano. Oh, okay. Also, okay, it's okay. courgette. It's not Thanks. zucchini. <laughs> Both of yeah. them are horrible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But but you you joke. But I'm working on a project where there is a um, recipe section, and um, so we also have localization. Actually, we don't, right? Because the whole app is in English for UK, 
Australia and US. So it was like, okay, we are good to go, right? English, you know, sounds like a legit language. And they were like, <laughs> nope. So we need nope. to find a nope. way because it's English, but you also need the where, like, because, you know, there is cilantro and there is, what's the other one? I can't remember. Well, like, uh, how is in uh, British? There, There is like, uh, ah, uh lemon lemon grass i guess is it one is well there are like the zucchini uh, you know that yeah, kind of stuff yeah. or eggplant and the uh, aubergine that kind of stuff and i was like why do people have to complicate this one i mean you had the you had it easy right one language a lot of countries okay i can speak <laughs> italian only in italy so that that's like a limitation a very huge limitation english well, that that's fair no 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 we need to be the, oh coriander okay yeah coriander. that's, that's yeah i wonder yep. uh, uh so it's uh, it was the so I can understand. Let's be specific. Anyway, the timer is running. Uh, Sebastian, yeah. do you want to pick another First, question, or you you have any other anecdote that you want to do, like an uh, impromptu anecdote? Plus, I wanted to thank Dennis <laughs> for the sub. Uh, we have a, a pretty random question from the chat, uh, <laughs> which is, "What is your currently daily okay. driver phone?" Can you see it? Uh, I have a, uh, I think this is a Samsung. Chat cannot S9. say. <laughs> yeah, and I'm waiting for the. You tried. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, so. Actually, I can't. It's ah, Pixel yeah, Four. Was... <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, it's 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 something that <laughs> folds, but it's not the Samsung. <laughs> you mean a book? Uh, I, uh, anyway, so uh, early days in Android, um, back in the Nexus days. Most of the people on the platform team would be using an early device uh, because you know testing, testing, testing. Yeah. Um, but these days, like I haven't, I haven't been tuned into the like new devices for a while. Like occasionally, you need to test something, uh, but I think there's not the same drive. Just given the number of people that we have on the team at the company, you know, also testing these devices, sure. not everybody needs to. And honestly, we don't have enough devices to share around anyway. So on any given release, I'm usually a, a phone that is a year or two, you know, back. I just get, you know, a normal um, public device. I may be running early builds on that thing, um, but I'm not necessarily running, you know, latest hardware all the time as I used to. So you, you get know, 10 bugs, but not all of the bugs. And I, I want to, I, I want to be the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I want to be I want to be the jerk here, and I want to say you know you already have uh, enough leaks on Google products and phones, so you don't need more people running uh, experimental pre pre <laughs> you know production phones. So we, we are good to go. So that's that's yeah. the uh, <laughs> fair enough. I, I don't want to, uh, but yeah, I actually I'm I'm waiting for the next phone, and I, I also the Pixel uh, Pixel the. 6 Pro, the one, the fancy one with the new processor inside. I don't even know because I can't buy it in <laughs> Italy. Thank you, Google. Uh, so I need to probably smuggle it from Germany or France or whatever. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm running on a Samsung at the moment. So, but we yeah. have another question from the chat. Yep. Uh, do you want me to take that? There was one above here also. There was a earlier one. Oh, no, yeah. no, you did it about the device. Yeah, the Java language yeah. choice. So actually that, I think the chapter in the book probably covers this in yeah. a great amount of detail. There's a chapter yeah. um, coincidentally called Java um, uh, that goes into yeah. the language discussion. So yeah, as it, yeah. when it started, the the original product was basically a JavaScript demo. Um, Brian Swetland was already working on the Linux kernel stuff, but the, you know, Android itself was basically 3,000 lines of JavaScript. And then they, you know, push the reset button and, you know, wrote the actual platform. And then there was a choice like, should we have JavaScript um, or should we use C++? A lot of the people, especially because many of the developers were very low level sort of embedded platform uh, developers, favored C++, especially because, you know, performance and memory concerns were really paramount at that time. And then Java was the other choice because it was a common language that people knew. And then the other choice, strangely, was all three. So some of the mechanisms that they were coming up with were language independent, which would allow them to call into things like, you know, binder interfaces from any language that they chose. Um, and then they ended up choosing Java for various reasons. 
Uh, one of them being, well, everybody knows this language. Everybody has best practices. Like, wouldn't it be nice if they didn't have to, you know, learn how to program in some language they're unfamiliar with or become an embedded programmer just to understand how to program to this platform? Uh, and so they chose Java programming language as a, a language that would appeal to the masses and to lower the barrier of entry for people coming to it. And, you know, other reasons as well, you know, nice language characteristics and don't have to deal with memory management and and blah, blah, blah. But um, I, I think appealing to many developers was certainly an important part of that. I also I also like the the mention about um, you know the IDE that at the time you you had Eclipse and there was also NetBeans so people were familiar with working with Java the tooling was uh, already there so that was also something interesting. And yeah, yeah, not with not C++, just there. But you, that's um, mm -hmm. not just there, but also free. Like that was a big driver yeah. for a lot of the technologies, yeah. a lot of the tooling stuff for Android was it had to be free. Like we weren't going to start charging people yeah. to run these tools. We weren't going to send you out to go, you know, buy a, a nice visual C++ tooling suite from Microsoft just to program for Android. We really wanted to yeah. make it as easy and, and cheap as peop, uh, as possible for people to, to dive into it. Uh, congratulations, nice. yeah. Harlem88 uh, on winning the DroidCon London ticket. Uh, we... Uh, sorry, Chad, again, sorry, Chad, again sorry. I lose. Uh, but <laughs> I'm going to have to cancel my tickets now. I don't have. I don't I'm have a sure we can in. smuggle you in, probably. <laughs> uh, even yeah. we'll get in touch with you folks on uh, on Twitch, the the two people that have won yes. the tickets, and we'll give you the promo code to get the tickets uh, for free on the event bright page for each event. Uh, just a reminder: in a few minutes, we're kind of mm -hmm. towards the end of today's stream. So in a few minutes before we close out, I mean, what? as I said earlier, chat, we can go on. I'm easy. I'm having a good time. So I'm happy to keep chatting. Okay. Um, great. I, I can but keep in, going. In any case, so. yeah. I'm awake <laughs> now. So. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll also pick the, well, uh, yeah, let's say a few minutes. Uh, let, we'll pick the IntelliJ license winner from our subscribers on YouTube. So if you haven't done that yet, you still have some time to do that. Just a reminder. Um, and now I want to ask a question. Yes. Uh, so something, Chet, that I remember Sorry. when the book came out, there was something that you were actually mentioning earlier as well, which is, it turns out that Silicon Valley is a small village where everyone knows each other, <laughs> pretty much, uh, and they have yeah. um, they've worked together, uh, and maybe they they work together in one place, and then after a couple of years, they either get poached by a former colleague or they just happen to join uh, a team where someone else they know um, is working. That that's something that for me, as someone that has never worked in Silicon Valley. I don't know if it's the same in other places in the US, but in Europe, that's not that common. You might end up working with the same person again, but it's not that common. So how do you deal with um, people you really hate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, burning bridges. How does it work, right? When, when, when you when you quit, rage quit a place and you change and then two months later they're actually there. So how does do you keep changing jobs? I, I like that your question is not like how does this dynamic work, but it's how do I still be a jerk when I leave a company and and how can I get around this this problem? Um, so yeah, maybe I'll I'll rephrase it to say don't. Don't do that thing. It's it's funny. Like I've I've been at all these companies because I do that Silicon Valley thing as well. I should point out too. Like I've been at Google since 2010 because it's been a great place to be. That you know was really dynamic and interesting and blah blah blah. But prior to that, and I I spent a bunch of time at, at Sun. But prior to that, like I was doing the same thing. Like every two to four years, I I try something new um, because the opportunities are there. But occasionally at some of those companies, like you'd see an email go around or you'd hear a story where somebody did exactly that, you know, rage quit or they sent an email, you know, up CCing all the executives up to the CEO with, you know, now I'm going to tell you what's really on my mind. And you're just shaking your head going, why did you do that? 
Like you just short circuited like your future self for what, you know, ego reason were you doing that? Like just try to keep things on an even keel because you will work with these people again, especially in this environment where everybody moves around, you know, sometimes by choice, sometimes by necessity. If you join a startup, there's a really good chance you won't be at that company sometime soon, either because acquisition or, you know, likely it's probably not going to exist. Um, so you you need to be flexible and understand that uh, everybody else is moving around uh, around you as well, which I I like. I think um, so. My my dad was retired Navy. My brother worked for the same company for I don't know ninety seven years, uh, and and so like to them it's a really foreign concept. And even like where I started my first job out of college was at a company in St Paul where people would join and they would just stay forever. And that was really more the the business environment there. And I think it still is in a lot of the country and a lot of the industries and certainly in different countries that I've encountered in the world. You know, I think Japan has a tradition of like you're at that company for your entire career um, and and some of the European countries, uh, the people that I know there as well. But I think the more you get like a place like Silicon Valley, I don't want to say it's special like this is a Silicon Valley thing, but it's more that there is so much opportunity here for this particular industry, and I'm sure this exists elsewhere, that that opportunity then just leads to possibilities for people where if you're bored, go find something that doesn't bore you. We do this with most of our waking life. Why wouldn't you try to enjoy your job? And so the ability to take advantage of that in an environment like this, I think is great because then, you know, not only does it keep you more interested in what you're doing every day as you're awake, uh, but it also enables you to learn more things so that you're not just becoming more and more of an expert in a shrinking and shrinking field. You're going and you're learning, you know, this technology and that technology, and then eventually you're able to sort of connect the dots and make better decisions about what companies should do because you have a wider scope of what the possibilities are. I think it's to benefit of the people as well as to the companies and, and the development of technology so that we have things where like people learn things at Apple and General Magic and, you know, Taligent and, and B and Android and Microsoft and all these places, and they can sort of put together um, these ideas that they've learned along the way to to help build better and better technologies. Yeah, as we go I was forward. obviously joking. Uh, rage quitting is never a good idea, even if you don't work in the Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> Being a jerk is not a good thing in general. You should avoid that. <laughs> no. So that's a public <laughs> public service announcement. <laughs> uh, I have uh, I have a uh, uh, yeah another public service announcement. Unfortunately, uh, so we are re-rolling the uh, ticket okay. for Berlin because yeah. Uh, so Subash uh, donated the ticket uh, I knew because it, of Jeff. logistics. <laughs> uh, so if you. So you can you can type again. You can type mozzarella for the next five minutes, and then we are gonna run again the ticket for. Even you're just uh, messing Berlin. with chat, aren't you? So go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically, basically, I'm trying to confuse it now. Uh, I'm I'm leveraging I leveraging the the early hours. Um, so. Uh, Sebastian, do we want to? Yes, pick first of all, question? I want to answer Mark that was asking if being a jerk is never a good thing. Does that mean that I'm no longer welcome on the chat? You're always Mar uh, welcome, Mark. You're, you're not a jerk, <laughs> oh. you're just a troll. That's different. <laughs> <laughs> we are not, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's not what we, what we mean. When, when we say that, we don't mean it, Mark. <laughs> uh. I um, yeah I do I do have a so, question. Chat, do you want to say something? What else? Uh, there was there was something we had talked about um, earlier before we got on the chat that I'll I'll say eventually, but I'll I'll um, I'll get okay. there. Uh, so go ahead. First of all, I um, this is not a prepared question. Just came to me. Um, so if I, no, no, it's fine. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's a it's a good question. Pro <laughs> probably um, brace. So, if I recall correctly, you are donating the uh, uh, proceedings from the book to charities. Um, do you yes. like? How did you choose the charities, and uh, uh, like, what are what do you hope that 
this will bring to uh, the wider community? Because I, I, I seem to remember their uh, coding related uh, charities, right? Yes. Yeah, so the the overall intention was to not make money on the book um, because I want to make it clear that I'm just trying to get the story out there. I'm not trying to like, you know, let's use the knowledge that I acquired for years from, you know, Google paying me a salary and then try to make money through some of them. I, I, I mean, I did it. It's a personal project. It was all my own time to put it together, but I was asking for time and energy from people to understand all this stuff. And, and so I'd be really clear about the motivations. So the donation is an important part of that. And in terms of uh, the organizations that I donate to, that's more flexible. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to choose stuff that was at least related. So currently uh, the plan is to donate to two coding related um, organizations, Women Who Code and Black Girls Code, um, because I, I think that one of the problems, um, which, I mean, if you read the book not too closely, you see um, the problem, which is the, the amount of diversity that we have in tech, um, in companies, in organizations, is not what we would like it to be. I think that companies, um, at least companies that are trying to do the right thing, are working on this, but it is a really hard problem to solve. I think we're doing hopefully better now than we were a few years ago when you know Android was starting, but it's certainly nowhere near where we would want it to be. And I think one of the problems with that is uh, there are many problems, societal, historical, whatever, uh, but one of the problems is just having opportunities for people um, in these other uh, diverse demographics, whether it is um, the opportunities to get an education in this, to be, you know, to grow up in an environment that encourages this, um, for all people to have job opportunities that open themselves up as opposed to like needing to be in some, you know, secret cabal network. Um, and so organizations that that can help in that um, in terms of training or job opportunities or career mentorship, I, I think is really important. So that's that's why I chose those two particular charities. Um, that is that is flexible over time. So when the audiobook uh, comes out, like again, those profits will go elsewhere as well. I've been looking at um, at both Wiki uh, Wikipedia and um, uh, Khan Academy as important resources for uh, technology people or just information in general. I think the the um, spread of of open information. Uh, is really important to uh, what we do with the web and and um, the internet in general. And so I'd like to support those organizations as well. I mean, to be realistic, it's still a book, right? So it's not going to be a ton of money for anybody involved, uh, but it's it's more the Tell idea around there if if it can help. What was that? Tell me about Yeah, yeah. No, not buying any Tesla <laughs> with the book. Yeah, no. <laughs> No, and that that was part of it too. It's like, well, you know what? Google pays me just fine. Let's not try to, you know, nickel and dime by trying to make money on something that is, you know, irrelevant in the long run um, compared to uh, compared to what we are able to make in the tech industry. Absolutely. Um, so, was that a good question? <laughs> uh, okay. That okay. that was a, that was a fine question. Um, yes. yes. Are please. we awarding points here? Okay, even uh, could you get a sticker? I actually just channel? got them, so I, I finally have stickers yeah, so myself. Just, no, no, you just want you just want a sticker. Uh, oh, get them. Do you I just stick it on my forehead now? Be like hey, this. Hey, hey, hey. It looks <laughs> one good question. It looks it looks real. I mean now now that now that you show the sticker, we actually have proof that we are sending stickers around, right? So now it's not like a rumor anymore. Actually, could could you do it physically? It, even could you pass a just sticker to Sebastiano? I'm below you. Where, 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 so I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. You're uh, so, like this, oh. like this. That. <laughs> and then it's, it's, <laughs> oh wow! Is that good? It was, wow, totally the production that value that was smooth. <laughs> that was smooth. Uh, anyway, let's run. Let's run the giveaway. Just give me a second. And uh, here you go. We have another winner for the ticket for uh, Droid Con uh, London. Was no, it was Berlin. London? No, it was Berlin. Actually. It was Berlin. Why I can't do? I can't do this, right? I mean, uh, it's anyway. too many. Anyway, 
No, but I'm yeah. Congratulations. So lost, <laughs> lost the game. <laughs> uh, I don't know who this chat person uh, on the chat is, but they're really unlucky. They, they, they are trying. They are trying. <laughs> by the way, um, so I uh, one of the questions that I that I have here is actually something that uh, uh, that I wonder how. So the, the question that we have, let me try to read it. Um, blah, blah, blah. When you joined the Android team, did you feel the spirit was the same that you described in the book from the earlier days or had it become more relaxed? Because there was a lot of pressure at the beginning, right? I mean, yeah. and, and you see it in the book. Right, but, right. It, it was both. Like uh, one, of the, one of the things that I wanted to get across in the story was what that feeling was that I did feel, but it had lessons. Like I was definitely working harder um, when I joined than I ever had before or than I have since. Like, you know, we all still work hard, but it was really driving very hard, especially for the Honeycomb release at that time where, you know, weekends, late, late nights, all that stuff. But it was nothing compared to what I heard about the early, early days. Um, so there was still that feeling of like, you know, everybody driving to make this thing work. Because when I joined in mid-2010, we were like clearly at the bottom of the smartphone players. Right. And above us was, you know, Nokia sort of owning, you know, phone market overall with various flavors of Symbian, smart and feature phone, whatever. Um, Apple had come out. They were doing quite well. Thank you very much. Uh, Microsoft was there and they're obviously an important player no matter what they do. BlackBerry was killer for its domain, like all of these players out there. And then there's this Android thing. And so we're all just driving really, really hard on the team to get in all the stuff that we need to to make it to be. Um, the platform that people actually wanted. And and until we got to that point, which, you know, frankly, nine months later, we're like, oh, I, I guess I guess we'll be here for a little bit longer. Um, then you always had this feeling like, man, if we don't do this now, um, then we've lost the window. It's 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 over. Um, and so certainly for the first couple of years, there was that that pretty intense drive through the honeycomb release, which was insane for many reasons. Uh, but I would say for the first couple of years, it was really driving that hard, but it was not compared to the early, early years. So I think the the feeling overall and especially the feeling of like everybody being connected to, you know, loyalty to the project, which was we're all working together, just trying to ship this thing um, together to make it work. Um, and then I think as an organization grows, like now the feeling inside the team and the company is is different because, you know, there used to be when I joined, it was maybe 300 people Android overall. And that's like apps, platform team, you know, biz dev, like everything for Android was 300 people. And now, you know, the apps are owned by the app teams, you know, YouTube and Gmail or whatever. So there's like many, many people working in other organizations and there's like hundreds or thousands of people working on this thing, right? And that, that necessarily um, puts in some distance, I think, between people and the thing that you're shipping, um, where it's, like, yeah, we're all still shipping this product together and we're all still really happy about this this thing that we're doing. But it's not that sort of one to one connection that you feel when it's a much smaller team driving under these yeah. constraints. You're kind of a. Yeah, it's more like, you know, the startup, the startup atmosphere yeah. where you have yeah, like exactly. a handful of people with uh, one specific goal. Well, I would say in this and, case, it was you know, uh, a handful of people with several goals each. I don't know how they kept sanity throughout the process because it wasn't a short one. Like that the whole book covers what, what is it like in the, in, like since joining Google, the what looks from reading the book like crunch lasts until, um, essentially the droid and nexus releases so yeah 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 they were driving i mean that insane release i mean 1.0 was a little bit over three years but then they were going like another year and a quarter past that just to ship the release that went out with the droid and then once the droid came out things started to actually tick over for the first time um but they were you know working on two sometimes even three releases in parallel they were doing three to four releases a year it was it was a pretty insane uh pace that they were driving at um just over and over and over and some people burned out and and ended up leaving by you know 1.0 um but a lot of those people just kept it going for a long time and you can't do it forever that that's part of you know the 
easing up as well. Like I wear, okay, well, not everybody was there late nights and every weekend. Um, we, we all still like, you still had crunch periods. We still had bacon Sundays. Um, but they were, it wasn't like the early days where, you know, everybody was there all the time because they really had to be, um, because eventually you don't want to do that anymore. Like you can do it. I, I found this in, in my tech career. I don't know if you've been through crunch periods, but like I draw, a a very clear line between a crunch period where you're aiming at a release and you work really, really hard. And then you get there and you ease up and you recover your sanity a little bit versus a death march, which is that deadline. Um, you're working really hard and then the deadline slips and you keep working really hard and you basically chase the yeah. deadline into the horizon. Um, and that's just, that's, it's, it's a morale killer, right? Nobody wants to be a part of that. I need to know that, at the end of working really hard, I can take a step back and breathe. And if I don't have that, I'm going to leave um, because it's it's not worth chasing the the death march thing. Like I'm not going to work that hard, insanely hard forever. Like that's not good for anybody. It's not good for the product either. Um, so there has to be an end goal in sight. And the team saw that with 1.0, but then really to the other pieces of functionality they needed to add to sort of get it to the, the not the minimum viable product, but certainly the product that people wanted out there. Yeah, it kind of uh, connects to a question that there is in the chat um, yeah. that I, I don't think the second part can be answered, but uh, definitely the, the fact that Andrew used to have maintenance releases yep. uh, and then those went away, I think it was I, I don't know from the from the outside having been through crunch i can imagine that at some point there was a need to give people breathing room between releases and and also organize things uh in a way that isn't oh yeah by the way we have a deadline in two months and then we have another deadlines in uh, other three months after that or something like that because that's like even if the deadlines don't slip it's still a death march right yeah yeah. yeah, just the fact that you change it to a different thing that you're death marching to doesn't doesn't change the fact that it's still a death march. Uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure I can totally. I saw this on Twitter as well, and I chose not to answer because I don't really know all the answers to everything, including the the uh, maintenance release. But I I I assume that the early maintenance releases were exactly that. It was like it was a really small team. They were running really fast. They had to hit that deadline for that release for a specific, you know, contractual obligation and and manufacturers spinning up product lines and blah, blah, blah. But they also needed this other functionality and they didn't have time to get it there. So then they get out their maintenance release as quickly as possible. Um, why they went away over time? Well, over time, we went to an annual release um, cycle where, you know, now we have more people. We have more time to consider what's going to go in. We have more time to organize the release. Um, and time things appropriately. And then maybe we just don't need those as well. I also okay. assume, and again, like these are my opinions. I don't know the product decisions, um, but I assume that um, security releases have something to do with that as well, where now we have an easier mechanism to get in the really written stuff that otherwise may have fallen into uh, a maintenance release instead. So we, we have a little bit of a, a release valve um, that we can tweak to get in that functionality. And then assuming that we were able to plan and execute the release in a little more organized fashion than we did in the early days, um, there's not the driving need for a maintenance release anymore. And uh, I, you know, from a, from a release point of view, I, I like the because there is also a Jetpack Compose question in the chat. So uh, about the release process. Uh, we have like what a release every two weeks for Jetpack Compose. You know that's the that also shows how things have changed, right? I mean, you you went from okay, we are shipping this thing uh, once a year, uh, or uh, and now we we are basically taking out part of the what we yeah. was considering the OS, and now we are shipping it basically every two weeks with stuff that is coming very quickly and it's a di completely different process, right? It's a bit more, well, quite more in the open uh, because you have a lot of more involvement and plus uh, it's, it's it's saving us. Thank you, by the way, sorry. This is just me. <laughs> yeah, no, me, it's me loving Jetpack Compose too much. So, but <laughs> thank you, it's, thank you. Uh, it's a great point. We did, we did, 
move, especially in the toolkit team with the, the technolo technologies that the toolkit team works with, um, we move developments and API developments uh, away from platform to as much as possible into Android X um, Jetpack uh, as a way for people to be able to use the new stuff on whatever releases their users happen to be on. And that's that's an important distinction because now we're no longer dependent upon, you know, shipping that platform release and then waiting, you know, anxiously for people to take advantage of it. Instead, we just release the bits and then it is up to the app developers when they want to release on on what cadence, um, which I think is is a lot more healthy. We can't do that with all capabilities. Like sometimes that thing needs to be a platform API. Um, but with things like Compose, we're building on top of stuff that already exists in the platform. So we have the flexibility to do that um, there and in the open just to, to get everybody going. And on, on the other side, there's a project mainline as well, where you can take parts of the platform and still update them uh, separately from the main release, which can yep. be helpful, especially for bugs, I can imagine. Yep. Uh, yep. That that is certainly the goal. Um, I I saw a confusing question there. It says, can you tell us the previous? Yeah, I'm not in sure. Brief, please. Uh, looking back at the last forty uh, hour and sixteen minutes of conversation, I'm not sure what story they were talking should, about. Should we retell everything? So, yeah, I don't probably. think I can. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, but in brief, yeah. Well, we, uh, we can, well, how about we pick another question? Okay, let's keep okay. it simple. <laughs> let's keep it simple. Yeah, I don't want to be the one, you know, party pooper, but let's let's pick no because we have a concern actually somehow related. Um and I I would like to know if there are um, um stories or anecdotes or even people that didn't make uh into the book that you would like, you know, they had um an impact but somehow didn't fit or they didn't agree to uh, show up in the book. And they probably wouldn't agree to we asked to talk about live, but okay, you got the point. So <laughs> <laughs> Do you don't uh, get a sticker for the question? I'm sorry, Ivan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, I don't think probably I'm giving the sticker back. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, so. I think in terms of stories, there were certainly a bunch of stories that I really appreciated, which didn't make the book either because of space. You always hear this with movies where directors are like, oh, I had the scene, I really loved it, but it didn't fit the narrative flow. And there was some aspect of that. There was also some concern, like the first draft I had, it was probably 600 pages long. Like it was just too long because I, I felt, especially after talking to all these really interesting people who share time and information that I needed to include everything that I got. And so I just kind of stuffed it all in there into this sort of incomprehensible mess. And then I needed to cut stuff out just to, to make it more of, you know, a smooth story that people could actually follow and hopefully stay interested in. Um, so some, you know, would get cut for, or it just, it just didn't fit in there. Um, others were like the, the team had really kind of a, a, quirky um sense of humor uh which you know took took the uh uh form of you know pranks that they would play or just you know email threads or whatever which i think are really funny and i think help describe the attitude of the team but i think the context of those needs to be understood probably a little bit better than i can convey in the book and so maybe those stories don't give the greatest impression of the team because you don't quite get the backstory in the context well enough. And so some got cut in terms of like, yeah, this is really funny. And I, I think it shows people in an interesting light, but maybe it seems a bit negative side. And so maybe, maybe that's something yeah. that I will avoid. And for the same reason, I'm not going to tell those <laughs> stories here either. Um, sorry. Yeah. But that's what you're looking for. No, but, but, I, but I, I understand, you know, you, you reach a point where in a very, very um, healthy team, you have a lot of inside jokes, things like, you know, it just, yes. I, I just, say something like one word and people start laughing because we know and that kind of stuff you know yeah the, the, you, you create that kind of atmosphere um yep. so that, uh, that's there was another part of your um question as well uh which was the the team members i i did want to get to this which was um like the overall question of well there were there people that you didn't talk about that were really important there were a lot of people that, that i didn't talk about that were really important um and i feel bad about that because 
by including some people, you're automatically excluding others. And then the question was like, well, why didn't that person get into the story? They absolutely should be there. Um, but, but I also felt like, as I said, the, the worst part of working on the book was having this feeling that I would never finish and the story would never get out there. At some point, I just needed to stop. Like the best part of the book was having these conversations with people. I really enjoyed learning what they were working on, learning how things came together, learning how things worked. And I could have done that forever, but I never would have finished the book. And also more, the more information I got, the harder it got to actually tell the story because now there's more data that I need yeah. to include and in how does that fit and you know, where do these quotes go and how does that interleave with this other bit? And so there were you know, many other people on the team. I'll mention some of them now because I feel bad. Like Jim Miller was working on a bunch of the lock screen stuff. Oh, was working on some of the, you know, testing stuff. I heard about uh, her very late in the game when I was talking to Pace and Wu, who worked a lot with her in sort of getting, uh, you know, compliance or, or you know, testing hardware stuff going. I'm like, I totally w should have talked to this person, but it was so late that I just needed to cut and run. Amit Yamasani comes up uh, briefly in there. I've worked with Amit. Um, for years, uh, he was on the framework team doing stuff there. Dave Bort comes up in the book, but I never really had an extended conversation with him. Uh, 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 Bruce Gay, same thing. Like I got kind of fact verification, but I I didn't get a chance to talk to him deeply about what he was doing. German Bauer was a designer um, that worked with Jeff Yaksik in early design stuff. Uh, I I worked with him. I knew him when I when I joined the team. So there were all these people that also contributed. I don't think. I, I can't think of anybody offhand that's like, oh, I, I needed to talk to that. That person was crucial and, you know, and the book is is worse for them not being there. It's more that the overall thing, like I think I talked to about 60 people. The team was about 100 people by the time it shipped. So do the math. There's a bunch of people that I yeah. didn't talk to. I think they could have helped flesh things out even more. Um, but I do think that I talked to a lot of the people that sort of formed uh, a bunch of the fundamentals, and I kind of got the the general sense of the story. I feel bad for the people that I didn't talk to. I'm sure there are important details, um, but uh, at some point I needed to ship the book. One yeah, still have the to sequel go to go and and put the other people into right. Exactly. That's also, yeah, I, I think. Yeah. I mean, yeah. volume one. Uh, something that I noticed about the book is that. Uh, there's a there's a large component uh, at least these days in the android team which is the uh, developer relations team which you have been part of for a couple of years as well and uh, there is some mention of that but i i think there's a lot of story yep. there that that still needs to be told and maybe that's book number two you know <laughs> uh, but <laughs> uh, i i should uh, so i'll i'll answer the question but i should also point out that um, you know, certainly there's more to the story and obviously Android has done stuff beyond, you know, where I took it go with the, the launch of the droid and I could certainly go into more details, you know, along the way. And I, I'm not going to tell that story. Like, I think I'm done talking about um, Android because like this was the story that I wanted to tell, sort of getting up to the point where you could kind of see the see the graph and see maybe Android will survive. Um, that was that was the thing that I wanted to talk about. I don't. I don't feel the need to go back and and talk about other details there. You know, maybe I'll feel differently after I recover in a couple of years. Um, but there is no problem. But I think in terms of and now I totally forgot where I was going with that question. What was it? What were you asking? Uh, it wasn't really a question. <laughs> it was more of a of an observation. <laughs> so you you've answered uh, it. Oh, developer <laughs> relations, right? Uh, yeah. Well, no, specifically the the Devrel team at the time. So. It's a it's a mixed bag in terms of what they were doing. It, like there was some important stuff. Like I remember going to I think it was a very early Google I/O and I saw a talk by Jason Chen and realized, oh my gosh, there's all these tools that make it really easy to just dive in and become an Android developer. And this is like when I was at Adobe um, and I was not playing around with mobile, but I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. Like they have an emulator, you can run this thing there. You, they're integrated into Eclipse at the time. They got all these docs and samples and and important stuff and the and the developer relations team was in charge of you know developing a bunch of that stuff as well as going out and talking about that but they were relatively quiet the the people leading the team at that time were not really into pushing android in a big way as a developer platform for various reasons like i think they they wanted to have a more solid footing uh at the time before 
before they really went sort of broad. And so I actually, when I joined the team, I interviewed with both relations and engineering because I've ever since, you know, early days at Sun in the early 2000s, I've enjoyed both of those things, right? I enjoy working on the technology and I enjoy talking about the technology. And so I'm always, you know, trading one of those things off for the other. And I thought maybe I'll Maybe I'll actually make the switch. And I did the same thing at Adobe, right? Um, where I was an engineer, but I'd go out and give talks. And I thought maybe when I go to Google, I'll actually you know, do the, the talk and the article thing. Um, and so I interviewed with both teams. And once again, I, I chose engineering instead and then did the DevRel stuff as a hobby, um, which is kind of the sweet spot for me. Uh, but developer relations at the time was really focused on partners. It was it was focused on, let's take a look at the big apps, the large companies that need to be a part of any platform that's out there, they need to run as well as possible. And then if you have time, you can talk to other people as well, but that's not our priority. And that's, that's clearly not where developer relations is at right now, where we have a whole team that does the articles, that do the so samples and tutorials and the conference talks when we have conferences. Um, and and so there 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 was a migration where like DevRel now is a much bigger thing certainly in the public view than it was then. Um, it was a bit more internal. It was people like Jason and Dirk Doherty was writing the docs. Dan Morrill um, was on the team or started the team at the time. Uh, my friend Dick Wall was on it. Like there was there was a group of people that were doing that, but I think it was a bit more. Um, internal focused or partner focused or also just working on the fundamentals of like the docs and the samples as opposed to like doing the the broad outreach stuff that developer relations does uh, now kind of follow up to that someone in the in the chat was asking why uh, you at some point switched to devrel and wondering if it was to get away from Roman I, I didn't really want to get into it, um, but yes, we won't absolutely. tell it. Don't worry. Uh, I I needed a break. Also, the the lawyers demanded it. it was actually it was kind of we had um, legally uh, that there needed to be some separation. <laughs> uh, yeah, it it was. I I mean it's it's exactly what I said, which was I've always th these have been conflicting um, priorities for me in my life, and eventually. I thought, you know what? Maybe it's time to actually just go off and do this thing, and then I can focus on that. And, um, and I learned a couple of things about myself. One was it was invigorating, I think, to then have the time to focus on that instead of saying, "Oh my gosh, I need to work on this I/O talk," except I got to finish the product. And then you feel like you know you're not you're not really able to do the things that that are important um, all at the same time. And so so it was nice to say, no, no, the talk is really important. That actually is my job now. Um, so that was great. Uh, but in the long run, I realized what the what the joy for me really is, is not just giving talks. Like, sure, I love giving talks. I, I even enjoy doing the videos, although certainly not as much as the live talks. Um, I mostly enjoy it when I'm talking about the stuff that I've worked on, right? So for me yeah. to actually work on uh, animation APIs or graphics technology or performance, and then give a talk about how that works. That is like the sweet spot. That is everything that I want from developer relations. Um, the other stuff where I'm going and giving a talk about stuff that other people have worked on, not as fun. Um, like I enjoy doing what's new in Android, but partially because I do that with Loma and I do it with Dan and we have a good time sort of, you know, let's do this research, learn how this stuff works, put it together, and then try to make some sort of engaging presentation out of it. Um, but technology wise, I would really go out, I would rather go out and, and do a talk about graphics. And I think if you're in developer relations, you don't get the chance to do that as much because the stuff that you talk about is by definition stuff that other people are working on. Um, and so I realized that maybe my life wasn't leading in that direction <laughs> and maybe I needed to go backwards before, uh, which is why I switched back to Good Android. answer, thank you. Ner nerds yeah. are gonna be nerds, right? <laughs> nerds gonna be nerds, exactly. Uh, I like that. But but I agree. I mean, that's the that's that's very relatable. You work on something and uh, and, and you want to talk about that. So that I I completely <laughs> I completely can relate to that. Uh, you mentioned uh, animations. Okay, I don't know very specifically what you mean with animation, but uh, we had uh, from the Jetpack uh, Compose team, we had Doris. Uh, yep. A few weeks ago, that she was working oh, on the yeah, animation okay. part. Yeah. Uh, do you do you never meet 
are you working on two separate words of the like <laughs> two separate meanings of the word animation that me being uh, five years old don't know about? <laughs> Uh, so it's all related, actually. So I, uh, the history of animation on Android, you know, I could probably write a book on that. It wouldn't be a very interesting book, uh, but there's a lot of information. When I joined, I joined because, so Roman tried to get me um, there back in 2007 um, because he realized that we needed property animation and I didn't come. I ended up at Adobe. Uh, and then he tried a couple of years later because we still needed property animation. At the time, there was animation on the system. It was the old android.view.animation classes and they're really quite awful um in that like they don't they don't change the objects themselves all they do is draw them differently which works for the most part but then you get weird effects where like you move a button and yet you still click on it in the place that it used to be right because it's not oh, changing nice. the button itself it's just cha changing where it's being drawn and there were various rendering artifacts caused by that or if you wanted an animation to just like run a timer on something, you ran an alpha animation as like a worker. It was just a weird system. Um, and so I came in and, and wrote the animator stuff, which was property animation and added the view properties to make it all work. Um, so it's on a more solid footing. Um, fast forward a couple of years, a guy named George Mount joined the team and he eventually took over animation stuff from me. Uh, and he also added, I had uh, done the transition stuff along the way as well, which builds on animators to be able to have more automatic animations between different um, different states of the application. George took that in and did uh, activity animations as well as adding some stuff to the animation system. Fast forward a couple of years, Doris joins the team. This is all in the toolkit team. She joined the team specifically because she wanted to work on some animation stuff. So she took over animations from George added things uh, to the animation system as well, also worked with um, animated vector drawables, um, seekable animations. So we were all sort of adding fundamental bits as we as we went along. And then the Compose project started and she owned animation at that time. And all of the Compose animation stuff is hers. She'd also added the, the spring animation stuff. That was sort of the last pre-Compose animation stuff. Um, that we had worked on and that was Doris's and then that fed into some of the stuff that's in Compose. So all of her stuff like that, that's all her in Compose animation. It is a, as far as I know, a completely different system, um, but uh, it, it's all also interrelated because we've all worked on all of the bits uh, going forward um, for, for better. I am a huge fan of your team's work. I, I love animations. As yeah. Ivan can testify, whenever we do an episode, at would, some point, I at some point, saying... I say, hmm, maybe I can animate that. <laughs> and now with Compose, you made it too yeah. easy. I was just saying. <laughs> it's like... Oh, nice. No, 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 it, it's, it's becoming, it's becoming serious because, I mean, I, I spend my, my live streams with Sebastian and Mark Ellison and they keep wanting to animate everything okay oh but we need we need to oh can we try a micro animation i was like what what would you animate oh we can animate this thing but, but i know gonna see. <laughs> so, yeah, but i i know that it's gonna be animated <laughs> i was like i mean for 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 who we are actually writing this app i mean for customers or for just you until animating things but he's uh, he's completely right i mean for me you know, I'm more like a back, back end, backstage kind of person from a uh, building apps point of view. You know, I'm not the UI person because I always found hard. Uh, if you say something like, you know, custom view or on draw, pre draw, I just get PTSD. So that's, <laughs> that's gives me anxiety. But with Compose, I find myself, you know, willing to try because oh yeah we just need to just wrap it with uh animated yeah. visibility kind of thing and oh this thing is nice right you just run it oh that was easy you know and ah. this actually is appealing um developers that are a bit different from what sebastiano right. you know is doing right now uh I, I i and this is great this is the great part of compose i guess which, which is great like i i think that's that's a perfect thing for us to have evolved uh, too. So I also obviously enjoy, you know, animation and graphics just on their own. But but I understand that, you know, not everybody has either the time or the interest um, or the wherewithal to do that, which means that then they don't get to the animations. Then, you know, the apps may be less usable because there are some really important cases for animation, I believe. Um, and so the, the drive for us, like 
at first we just wanted, wanted to add some stuff so that you could do things. We wanted to make it easier. So view property animator was like, I just want to set and forget, like animate to this thing, right? Without thinking about it. Transitions were also uh, the same idea. Like I just want an automatic thing to happen um, when the app application changes state. And so we kept evolving ways to make it easier and a bit more automatic. Um, but I think we were still quite a ways away from, you know, making it easy for everybody. And there are always these, you know, fragile use cases of this and that. And if if Compose has um, taken that further and made it even easier and more automatic, then that's a fantastic thing because that hopefully will make for better applications. Yeah, I think one general. of the maybe most uh, underused APIs we had in the in the view world was um, animate layout changes slash uh, begin delay transition which like a lot of people yeah. didn't really know that they were there. So a lot of, of applications on Android that could easily animate between states don't really do that because, uh, well, maybe before um, constraint layout, it was more complicated, but with, with constraint layout, uh, things like uh, animate layout changes can help a lot, but also motion layout in general uh, also adds a lot of ability yeah. Um, to to make things nice. Let, let's put it that way because yep. it's like animation is one of those things I find that it's often left behind because it's not it's not like on on anyone's uh, specific uh, Trello board of priorities uh, when it comes to product people and, and management. But I as a user, I, I love the fact that, an, that, that I see an, an application in which the developer has put the time and the skill to, to polish the UI and to, to use animation to convey meaning and to convey context, which is something that I find very useful. So here's to yep. hoping that a lot more people uh, will have time to do that now with Compose because it's easier. <laughs> Yes, that, but you, that you is mentioned time, and you mentioned time, and I I saw a message by Dart Kali in the chat, and they're they're mentioning the same thing. Yeah, with Jetpack Compose now we have time to play with this because it takes me a minute to write a a lazy column instead of a two hours to write a recycle view. So now I have have literally one hour and a half to actually try some animation. So that will uh, probably definitely improve because most of the time, those are like micro animations. You know, you, you never expect that a developer comes up with like some fencing stuff because then you have to have a conversation with a designer <laughs> like, oh, what what's this thing? You know, the iOS app is different. What, what have you done with the Android app? So, but you know, if you if you keep it simple, if you keep it small, you probably can, uh, you know, you can, I don't know, pull it off <laughs> easily if it's just like a tiny crossfade or like a tiny animation here and there. So I love it from Compose. This is this is so easy. Um, I have one other question that I I had actually I had came to my mind first when I first read the book and I was just waiting for an opportunity to, to ask it. Uh, but I thought that would be in person at some point, but maybe now I can do it publicly, it's even better. Um, one thing. Unfortunately, I didn't win a ticket for either Berlin or London, so I won't oh, see you in those cities. Uh, uh, but maybe yeah, maybe so if, I give you, if I give you good. enough uh, Code with Italian stickers, you can swap them, trade them with a conference ticket. I don't know. Does that work? What's the exchange rate? <laughs> <laughs> I, I <don't> know. <laughs> I'll try. Uh, but yeah, the, try. the question is, uh, and needs a bit of a premise, something that you often hear from people, especially people that aren't um, in the software engineering and uh, world, uh, is that uh, there's this misconception maybe that the uh, that Android didn't really exist before the iPhone was created. and or you hear the variant, which is Android was essentially an entirely different thing until the day that the iPhone launched. Um, and I, I, I actually found it very striking that, that there is sort of an indirect answer to that in the book, uh, which is that it was essentially just a, a change of priority to adapt what to what the market was at that point. But maybe 
you you can expand on that a bit more because it's it's kind of mentioned I find between the lines in the book. Uh, I don't know if you have uh, like a story to to share specifically about that. Sure. Uh, yeah, I love this quote by Brian Swetlin, which I, I can't even paraphrase, but um, like for the people that think that Android completely changed after the iPhone was announced and then, you know, it, it became what it, what it was when the SDK came out, he said, I love that people think that we could push reboot and redo the entire platform in that amount of time. Like, wouldn't that be amazing if that were the fact? Um, but the actual fact was, no, 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 we had all this stuff working and it was always in the plan to do all the stuff that 1.0 eventually was, but it was a matter of prioritizing and timing stuff. So the time that the iPhone came out, um, there were already a lot of things at work, you know, in what would be a smartphone platform, but the real um, thing that changed was touchscreen capability. So touchscreen had existed before on, you know, laptops. I remember my manager at, at, Adobe sort of walking around with this, you know, stylus driven thing in Windows. This is like after after 1.0 ish, um, but like still like laptops had had this for a while and, and and you know, other devices. So touch screens had existed and there was actually, I think it was an LG, LG device um, that okay. had come out with a touch screen. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I, I mentioned in the book, I forgot what it was, had come out like just before the iPhone. So it was not a new thing, but I think the iPhone sort of encapsulated a lot of the ideas and put it into a form where people finally got it and said, oh, that is what I need. In in this thing that is going to be this, you know, smart platform that sits in my pocket, that is that I need there. And, and then it became a checkbox item in the industry um, that, okay, well, if you're going to have a smartphone, then it needs to have a touch screen. And maybe it needs other things as well. Maybe it also needs hardware. Maybe it needs trackball. Maybe it needs D-pad. You know, maybe it needs all of these things. Who knows? Because, you know, all of this stuff was new, but clearly touchscreen needed to be part of it. And at the time, Android's first device that was in the plans was called Sooner. And it was essentially a BlackBerry type device. It was a screen that was not touchscreen capable with a keyboard sitting below it. Um, and that was, you know, one of the things that people had in mind for um, for these phones, certainly BlackBerry was doing very well with that form factor. They had a devoted user base. And so it seemed reasonable at the time, but then after the iPhone came out and was announced, people said, oh, that's the thing as a consumer, that's the thing that I want. Um, and then the manufacturers are looking at that going, oh, well then that's the thing that we need to ship to be able to compete uh, in this world. And then uh, Android basically did a pivot. They said, well, you know that touchscreen capability that we're working on, that was always the plan, that needs to be the plan for 1.0, and that needs to be the plan for the first device. So the the second device in their in their plans at the time was called the Dream. Uh, it was a HTC Dream device, or it was based on that, um, and that became the G1. They basically said, okay, well, we can't come out with sooner now because like iPhone is going to come out with this touchscreen thing, and then we're going to come out come out with a BlackBerry competitor which doesn't make sense in that context. Yeah. So, and it's off, you know, the touchscreen enabled thing that we were working on because we're gonna be focused on shipping this BlackBerry thing. So instead, we'll kill the BlackBerry thing uh, or we'll we'll kill the non-touchscreen device, um, the Sooner device, and we'll focus everything on getting 1.0 out with uh, G1 with touchscreen capability, in addition to the slide out keyboard, in addition to D-pad, in addition to like all of the bells and whistles were in there just, just in case. Um, but but yeah, so it was really more about a, a change, uh, a change in priorities and timing of things as opposed to like pushing reboot completely. I, I love how even though everyone was working super hard, uh, the G1 essentially had everything and the kitchen sink into it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was weird, like, you know, reading the book and certainly writing the book and trying to understand these stories, there was a there's a conflict between people being incredibly pragmatic and like making a decision and moving on, you know, like the Java decision, like, yeah, they debated for a while, you know, Java's JavaScript, C++, everything, all of them, two out of three, whatever. And then someone makes a decision and they just move on. Right. Um, versus they would build in capabilities um, like the IME capability uh, was one of those examples in the book where like, from the beginning, they realized, oh, it's not important for us to ship a keyboard, um, a soft keyboard that that people use, 
Um, it is instead important for us to ship a framework that developers can develop their own keyboard or speech input or you know other kinds of input. And so they they would they would make these very pragmatic you know and cut and run decisions, and they would make these other decisions that were like, no, no, no we're building for a platform universe for devices that we cannot even imagine right now. And so they would build in much more general Future capabilities. Proof. Yeah, yeah, and it, it really was. And I think uh, you know one of the people. That, that most drove that was Diane. Like from the beginning, as as Mike said, I think it's in the book somewhere, like she was like, you know, in 2007, she was thinking of things that the 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 platform would need, you know, in 2012 or something. Like she was always thinking in terms of the future of the platform and these, you know, future devices and form factors that didn't exist, which is really weird in hindsight. If you imagine that, they didn't even know if Android was going to succeed, much less that it was going to be picked up by, you know, Samsung and and manufacturers in China and India and like all over the world doing whatever they wanted to with the platform. And yet she was able to say, OK, well, these are the capabilities that the device or that the platform needs to have in order to support these things that we can't even imagine yet. OK, um, I will take uh, one minute to pick uh, someone that has won the IntelliJ license. And I'll just uh, run it now. Yes. Okay. Uh, congratulations to Antonio Gisondi, so, was commented on our YouTube. Oh yeah, come on! Apparently, really? we're, we're doing it. We're doing really? Italians now. I don't know. No, 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 no. But it's even it's even better. Antonio Gisondi is Harlem Okay. He also, he also won the Droid Gold Lando ticket. <laughs> How many how many people do we have actually watching? Is it only three people? It's 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 me, Sebastiano, and Gisondi, apparently. <laughs> and I've closed the window, <laughs> so I don't even get that. <laughs> okay, but any anyway, oh yeah, actually, in chat, Mark is actually pointing out, yeah, you didn't win the IntelliJ license, so you need to stick to Android Studio. I'm sorry. I mean, uh, yeah, probably, but we we are running a giveaway every week, so you can try again next week. I will. Um, I will. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm pretty sure that you, you you can't convince your employer to buy a, a license. So stick with us. You can win one. Uh, <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, so uh, anything else? Because I think that yeah. we, we need to wrap up because this 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 gentleman has to have his Sunday. So uh, I would do the thing that Chet does on ADS every time, which is ask you, is there any question that we haven't asked, but we should have asked you, Chet? You would think, since I put people on the spot with that, that I would think of that myself <laughs> uh, beforehand and think, oh, you know what's the thing I should talk about? Um, and I... Can't I can't I can't think of now that. you know no. how it feels. <laughs> um, I would say uh, encourage people to yeah. check out the book and see. I think there's a there's a reading sample on uh, Amazon. Like you can do the look inside thing, and also some of the ebook sites like Play Playbooks. Um, so you can check it out and see if you you know like the style and the story it's trying to tell. It's it's sort of covering a lot of the um, intro beginning stuff. Uh, and talk about it on Twitter. Let me know what you think. Like one of the aspects, and I'm sure uh, even you are familiar with this, like when you do a project like this, I, I want most of all for people to be able to access it and enjoy it. I'd also like to hear about it, right? Because I live with this story on my own for four years. It was just me talking about it far too much with my <laughs> wife and she's really sick of it. She doesn't <laughs> want to talk about it anymore. Um, and so yeah. like I... Yeah. I I like the idea of people enjoying it. I also like the idea of people saying, you know, here, here's what was really interesting, or I have a question about that, because that that makes it more of a, a real project that's not just, you know, in my mind, um, festering for I am years. very, very happy that I, you I managed to get through uh, the, the dark days of not knowing uh, what was going to happen of the book, and that you managed to uh, publish it because again I personally and I, I'm not saying it because you're here I, I personally really enjoyed it and even is my witness I have told everyone that I know that you should read it so <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh 
yeah but but it's a, it's a it's a fascinating book because it's we we had this conversation it's like in english i guess it's page turner right i mean it's it's a it's, it's, it sounds it sounds it reads like a novel right it's not like a a techy nerdy book but yeah, it is but it isn't right you know you you can you you have a lot of oh yeah this is cool but if you know the details you also know what you are talking about without checking the footnotes most of the time because that's you know <laughs> that's what, that's also nice uh but it's a nice reading it's a nice reading so i yeah, i'm a huge fan huge, huge fan yep. thanks i uh thanks for that I, one, one of the things i'm really curious about too like and, and i'll learn more i think as as the real publisher takes it and and hopefully brings it to a wider audience is that you know clearly the people who are most acquainted with the book now are Android developers because those were the people that I was able to reach. Like I am the marketing department for the book, and so you know that that's the people that hear about this thing. And I think it's great that that community likes it um, and uh, and is excited about it. And that's you know the most important audience I think because you know we're all a part of this thing. But I specifically wrote it so that real, real people, people can read it as well. Which <laughs> I mean, like I don't. I I don't want you to have to be a, a software developer or an Android developer in order to understand and appreciate the book. I want it to be a book about social tech history and business concepts that I think anybody interested in those genres would be able to consume. As my wife said, who is one of my most important reviewers and editors in the book, like there are some chapters in the middle that people to skip, but the, the key thing was, can you skip those and still follow the narrative flow of the book? Right. So are you going to be, you know, a little bit in the weeds in the framework chapter? And I don't really care about intents and binder. And so I'll flip forward a few pages and sort of pick it up um, later where we're talking about applications or whatever. And hopefully it still works at that level and people can enjoy it as as a story that's told and as a history that happened. And I, I think the jury is still out on that. But that is I'll, that's uh, my my secret hope. I'll, I'll and go now, to my I'm girlfriend so with a book and ask her to read it and I'll let you know what she says. Okay. She's definitely not in tech. Yeah, or, or don't. No, I, I can't. No, I, I, I can't do that because uh, back in the days, my wife uh, well, were, was playing the part of probably your wife, Chet, and she knew at some point more about Rx Java than most of my colleagues. And it, you know, it was not a good time for her yeah. because she was like, even I, I just stop, stop, you know, I don't care anymore. Just basta. That's enough. So yes. Um, so let's let's close with what the the last question from the chat, which is when is the movie coming out? Have you sold the rights to Netflix already, or? <laughs> I, I would I would I would give the rights and I still can't get them to call me back. Uh, so yeah, I'll I'll let you know uh, when uh, when Spielberg's people is that the uh, universal signal people. for I have to go because the dog wants to go even. <laughs> yeah, I mean Mark Mark was was asking where Spike gone. So you have to see see Spike goes in that corner. So <laughs> but it's super dark. So I actually added a spike a spike light. So Mark can see the dog when he goes there. So that's the that's, you know, that's what we do for our. So yes, he's in the spike corner. Okay. Um, anyway, I think uh, uh, that we should. Yeah, yeah. The tracks. Sorry, the tracks is asking if you answered the question about the donuts. And yes, it was how many? Four hundred and four four hundred sixteen, I believe, as a minimum. And. and at least, as, yes. Yeah, and as Mark pointed out, it's definitely fewer than the footnotes. <laughs> so that's uh, that's also a thing. You know, if you are in num, if you are in stats nerds kind of thing. Yeah. You okay. Uh, let's wrap it up. Thank you, right. Chet, a lot. Like this has been a lot of fun. I, I love having chats with people, especially when they have interesting stories. And you definitely have collected some interesting stories. And uh, I'm I'm very thankful for you uh, taking the time on a Sunday to to join us. So again, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for having me. This was fun. I also like having conversations. It is why I do the podcast. Like you would think that I do it so that Android developers could learn more information, 
<laughs> I'm way too selfish for that. I do it because I enjoy having fun conversations with other technology people and learning about what they do. So whenever, whenever you're ready with the uh, sequel, uh, no spoilers, but whenever you're ready with the sequel, so you, if you want to come back or even before, just to chat about whatever, uh, that's also fine. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Maybe uh, um, I'll come back sure. and talk about graphics stuff uh, as I get Absolutely. deeper into that in the new job here. Nice. So. I mean, we have Matrix 4, we can have Androids 2, right? I mean, why not? The sequel that nobody needed? <laughs> Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, and my wife and my wife in particular doesn't want. That was the best thing about shipping the book in August was then she got to get it out of our constant conversations as well. Okay, uh, so. I want to thank again everyone. Uh, don't forget to um, join us again on Wednesday for our next stream. Uh, we are probably going to be, well, we will definitely be back to live coding. We'll do some feature work. Uh, and then next Sunday we have uh, Mark back with us. And... Uh, there's probably going to be a lot of trolling <laughs> or animations <laughs> because that's what we do. <laughs> and uh, a lot of thank you, get chat. Everyone, don't forget to read the book. Like, seriously, I'm not paid to say this. You should read it. It's super interesting. And if you don't care about the internals part, as, as Chet said, just skip a page or two. You'll be, you'll be fine. Even just the story is really interesting of how it all came to be. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye. Ciao, ciao.